This morning and tonight, we've not had any testimonies. There were last night. But if you were healed of something, you're 80% or more, and you've had it for a long time or as a, something that was uh, significant, and maybe you didn't have it for a long time because you had an accident, but it was very bad damage. There's something you couldn't do. You can say, this is all I could do, and now I can do this. This is all I could do. Now I can do this. This is all I could do, but now I can do this. There's something you can show us the difference. Or another thing um, I mentioned this morning, I've been healed of nine herniated discs, three different accidents. One in Nigeria, a guy fell, wasn't expecting to fall. He's like 6'6", 250, 300 pounds. He wasn't expecting to fall, and he grabbed my wrist and went straight back, eyes like that, and I didn't have enough time to protect my head. My head went into his chest. You hear it pop 50 feet away. Ended up four herniated discs. Got prayed for by famous people. You would know every person I was prayed for are so well known for healing. If I told you who prayed for me, I didn't get healed by one of them. And then in my school, one of the guys who's my newest associate now, he was 18 or 19 years old. I'm going down, getting words of knowledge. Give, they're giving the school members, members of my school, giving words of knowledge. And I said, do you have one? He says, I think I do. Somebody's here, you got cervical disc damage. Well, of course, that's me. He said, and, and uh, the Lord showed me your birthday is February the 18th, 1952. That's my birthday. Now, that will build your faith. So I wanted to make sure it's me. Does anybody here have a birthday, February the 18th, 1952? Not one. So I said, nobody has that but me. And I asked him to pray for me. He prayed a short prayer. I was instantly 80% better. Normally, we have him pray again. I said, it's that kind of word with that specificity. You don't need to pray again. I know what's done. And within days... That, that had been lasted a year. I was told I was never to get on an airplane again because I had classic travelers back. Five hours, six hours a week, an hour a day, six days a week, physical therapy. Two epidurals. If they didn't work, surgery. They didn't work. Walking on crutches. 90 days. I go to bed, I have again famous people all over the world praying for me. Some came to the house, some called me, some I called. I wasn't healed when any of the famous people prayed. But one night I woke up in the morning, reached for my crutches and accidentally touched my foot to the floor and it didn't hurt. I got out of bed, I put all my weight on it, it didn't hurt. I walked, didn't hurt. The real test, go up steps this way instead of this way. I yelled at my wife, I've been healed. I don't have an idea how it happened. I know I'm healed. I know God did it, but I don't know how he did it. Five hours later, listen to this. Five hours later, a man who's an oil and gas businessman in Louisiana who'd been to India and Brazil with me, who knew I had a condition, was in a little, it was, it was on a Sunday night, and this was Monday morning. He was in a little country church somewhere, and in the middle of worship, God took him to an, into an open vision in which he saw me. From the back, my clothes came off, my skin came off, my muscles, every, and he's looking at my skeleton and the neurological system, clearest day. And he hears a voice from heaven tell him, take your finger, and you see where the stuff is squirted out of the disc and is lying on the nerve, push it back in. So in the middle of this vision in this little church, you see this guy, he, he said, they must have thought I was crazy because I was... Now, I have a question for you. How much faith did I exercise when I was healed in my sleep? Yeah. 
But God healed me through an act of obedience and this guy responding to what God showed him. And I'm not even going to go into the other one where the others were hurt in a car accident and I was healed. I guess what I want to say is sometimes God's faithfulness and his promises, we, 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 we come into a place of faith and we receive healing. There's other times when we can't get there. No matter how much we quote scripture, no matter how many times we make the confession, we just can't get there. And God comes and does for us what we can't do. And he creates that faith in the person being healed or somebody else praying on their behalf. I believe that God wants to release a better understanding of the diversity of his ways, the creativity of God, and the importance of, of this grace that comes not only to receive a healing, but the grace that comes in his sovereign purposes. And he releases to you not a healing for you, but the gifts of healing in you and through you. And tonight, uh, I believe God's going to do that. I, I believe uh, what happened at my vice president's church, he had a Pente he was Church of God Cleveland Pentecostal. Went to his church in January of, uh, of 2000. And the power of God came. And people in his church who never were even excited about God were so touched under the impartation that they became his key leaders in the future. Maybe you've seen the book by Darren, the, the video by Darren Wilson. I forgot his father of lights or whichever. This Mike and Dina Van Hall in China with the missionaries. That was one of those couples who were nominal Christians. Last ones to church and first ones out. Last ones in. Set on the back row. Not excited about the things of God. They were so touched that they doubt whether or not they were even saved prior to this impartation. They got there late. There's no room in the back, so they had to get seated on the front row. <laughs> came time, and I, I was preaching on impartation. Came time for the invitation. I said, if you want to be in on this, stand up. And they stood up. They were right in, right in the aisle there. And when we said, come Holy Spirit, God knocked them both down. <laughs> Tom told me it shocked me to see them go down. But when they got up, they were different people. I mean, they literally were different people, and they have given themselves. They bought one-way tickets to China, not knowing how God was going to use them. And their story is an amazing story. The guy who oversees my ministry trips now, he was a state police officer, motorcycle guy on state police. He and his wife were there. They, too, were touched that night. So touched that he resigned his position and they went and lived in the slums called favelas of Brazil, ministering out of such passion. I remember one time I was teaching on this subject in Brazil, and I mean not Brazil, in Toronto. And it were at the end and hundreds of pastors are coming up. And actually it was not just an impartation. It was an impartation that God was going to take people into apostolic ministry who were pastors and move them into the apostolic as if you'd want that. There's not only apostolic signs and wonders. One of the other signs of apostolic ministry is apostolic suffering. <laughs> yeah. And so hundreds are coming forward and I felt like the Lord, I, I said, stop. Listen, if you get this, if God does give this to you, it probably is going to mean you're going to be gone from your wife and your kids at least 50% of your life from here on out. It means you will probably be gone from your church 50% of the time. If you're not willing to pay that price, go sit down. At least 50% of them turned around and went and sat down. One of them was a pastor of a church of 80 people in, I'll tell you the state, but that's all I can tell you because God's keep him hidden even to this day this was 94 um, and so he came forward 
And he had a, something wrong with his feet. They would cut and break. They would get so dry, they just the skin would, and no podiatrist had been able to fix it. And their, his feet would bleed, and they hurt. So he came forward, he receives prayer. Fire, it said, it felt like fire. So much heat came in his feet. He said, I went back to my room. I took my shoes and socks off, took my clothes off, and stuck my feet in the shower so the water could cool them off because they were hurting so bad. Went to sleep and woke up, and what no doctor could heal, just through a sleeping, I woke up, and I had baby skin without any cracks on my feet. Now, one of my assistant pastors later would leave my church and go from Missouri and go to Indiana and became on his staff. So that's how I know all the details of this. He literally spent the next 20, 25 years gone from his church, his wife, and his kids, 50% of his life. He ordained thousands of people into the ministry on many continents. His church today, it had 80. Within the first year, it multiplied to 400. And today, it's the biggest building in their city. It is an apostolic center. But it had a price tag associated with it. I just want you to know when God's Spirit comes on you, there is a price tag attached to it. You can't buy it, but it will cost you. But it's worth it. Even though a lot of my illustrations are going to be for pastors, I'm purposely going to try to remember to include illustrations for women as well as men and lay people as well as clergy. The other thing is I want you to know my focus isn't on any manifestation tonight or any sign. Any sign. It's not on laughing or crying or falling down or shaking or speaking in tongues or any sign or any manifestation. That's not my focus. My focus is whatever God, in whatever way he wants to in his diversity, that he chooses to touch you, that you will be grateful for that. That You'll trust he knows the best thing to do to you in this occasion. And what I mean by that is the first two times that I was powerfully touched... The first time, I, I felt like I'd grabbed a hold of an electric wire. I grew up on a farm. <laughs> I know what it's like to walk into an electric fence. When I walked into an electric fence, I would feel my joints hate, ache for at least 24 hours. Just the electricity that would go through my body from the electric fence caused my joints to ache for 24 hours. And that first time I was ever filled with the Holy Spirit... I shook, and I felt heat, but then for 24 hours, my joints ached from the shaking that happened. Now, I was called to preach at 18 years old. And when I first entered the ministry, I would read the stories, the biographies. I love biography of uh, D.L. Moody. When he was filled with the Holy Spirit, this was pre-Pentecost. This was in the 1800s. Um, he went in his room and he said, Lord, stay your hand lest you slay me. I can't stand anymore. Charles Gradison Finney, in his autobiography, he talks about it in this way. I perceive that if these waves of liquid love and these waves of electricity would have continued to come over my body, wave after wave after wave after wave, I would have died. So at 18 years old, I began to cry out to God. God, I've never heard of anything like that. I, I was Baptist. <laughs> I've never heard of anything like that. But if you're still doing that, I want it. God, I know what it's like to feel you emotionally. I, when I was converted, I wept and I wept and I wept. And when you come and touch me, the first thing that happens, I start crying. I, when I was five years old, my mom would be touched by the Holy Spirit and she'd start crying. My dad would start crying. and said, why are you guys crying? And 
They said, because we're happy. I said, well, if you're happy, why are you crying? My dad said, well, when you get older, you'll understand it. Understand it. But I wanted more than to be touched emotionally. I said, God, if it's, power, if it's possible that you're still touching people with your Holy Spirit so strongly that they fear death, I want you to touch me, God, so strong that I'm afraid you're going to kill me. Now, I want to tell you, that is not a safe prayer to pray. I started praying that in 1970 or 71. 1984, electricity hurt my joints. Five years later, I was prayed for at the end of a prophecy that said, one day you'll travel the nations. God's going to use you. And I didn't own a passport and didn't want to leave the country. I'm pastor of, a, of start, starting a church. It's not very big. And this prophetic word was, one day you'll travel the nations. And I'd ask the Lord, Lord, John Wimber said the first time he met me, he heard you speak to him audibly. And you said that one day you were going to send me around the world, that there's an apostolic call on my life to activate gifts and for people to be filled with the Spirit. Bob Jones, the prophet, said I had a gift to teach. I'm a pastor. I love evangelism, and I'm confused. <laughs> what am I for? My, I, my church wasn't even 100 people yet at, at, this, at this moment in 1989. I started it, just my wife and I. What am I for? I want to focus on what I'm for. Send somebody to me tonight and have them prophesy what my destiny is so I can focus on it. And then that night, that guy came who today is an Anglican bishop, but then he is a leader, overseer of the region of, in the vineyard movement. He said, you're going to go to the nations. So he talked about my son would travel with me and a lot of other things. So I went, I went up to him because I was so shocked I didn't even have a response. I said, hey, Ron, that was a good word. But I had, I, I, it didn't sink in. I was shocked. That's an exciting word. Would you pray into that? So he and the vineyard overseer of my region, two of them, began to pray. My overseer has a rule. You do not blow on anybody when you're ministering to them. That's a rule. It's, it's not biblical because Jesus whoo, blew on his disciples in the, on resurrection night and said, receive the spirit. So if Jesus can do it, you shouldn't make a rule that you don't. It was a bad rule. But anyway, the point was, he had a rule. You don't blow on anybody. He blew on me. And when he blew on me, it's like somebody knocked me in the floor. The electricity is going so strong, it's hurting. And the longer I'm on the floor, the stronger it's getting. My face feels like it's electrified. I'm sweating profusely. I'm screaming. I'm just not crying. I am literally screaming. I am a pathetic mess on the floor. I, I, I actually could hear everything going around. And some people said, do you think it's a demon? And I'm thinking, no, it's not a demon. I'm just being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't say come out. Leave me alone. And then I heard that guy say, I believe he'll become one of the most famous evangelists in the vineyard movement. And I'm thinking, that's much better than being demonized. God, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I like that one, you know. I was only on the floor 45 minutes to an hour, <laughs> somewhere in there. But when I got up, I had to hold my hands like this to my chest. Because if I let my hands go down past my waist, they start hurting with so much electricity, I had to pull them up again. Now that story is not near as significant, nor as demonstrative, nor as long as some of the stories I'm going to tell you that happened to other people. But it was my experience. We have to be careful about fruit inspecting. Because after that first experience in 84, I immediately started to have words of knowledge. And for the first time in my life, I had never prayed for anybody as a pastor. Though I'd been in ministry 14 years, I'd never prayed for one person that had fallen down. But after that experience, it started happening for the first time. I started getting words of knowledge. I started seeing more healings than... I saw more healings in, in a month I'd seen in 14 years of ministry. 
And then after 89, it was much more powerful. But there was almost no new fruit. Except there was a level of holiness I was broken into where an area of my life I'd been defeated in, I got victory in. And I didn't even recognize it for about a month when I realized, oh gosh, my python has turned into a tetsy fly. That which I couldn't resist, I'm now able to resist real easy. Something was broken off. Maybe they were right. Of course, it's on, of course I'm realizing the assemblies of God, so it was on the outside bothering me, troubling me. It wasn't inside. It was outside troubling me. So I'll be politically correct in that situation. Long story, I wanted to get to this. Four years later, I go to a Rama church because of, uh, of Rodney Howard Brown. And a young man that had been in my Baptist church in 84 calls me at midnight, talked to me till 3 in the morning. My church is growing. We're in a good place. We had 92 baptisms that year. Of us. It was, you know, it almost was a third of the church. Uh, we grew, it was going well, but I was spiritually drying up and pretty miserable. I don't have time to tell you the details of that story, except my friend called me and told me that what happened in my Baptist church was happening again through Rodney Howard Brown. And I asked him for his manifestations. By, matter of fact, everything I saw in the first uh, 42 of the first 60 days in Toronto, I was the uh, one that God sent there and and, and I, everything I saw there, I'd seen my Baptist church 10 years earlier. It's like there was a first fruit, and then there was the full-blown meal, except there's just more people. So I go to see Rodney, because I asked my friend who's telling me this, because I remember Jonathan Edwards, he wrote a book about whether or not something, manifestations are of God or not. And in the book, he basically, and he's probably the most famous theologian about revival in American history. In the book, he said this, you cannot tell if a move of God or you cannot tell if a manifestation is God, the flesh, or the devil by looking at the manifestation. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I like to say is similarity of manifestation does not mean similarity of causation. Because there are things that even in Satan worship that, that looks like, you know, some of the things they do, with, you know, with candles and prayer. And there, there, there are things. It's a spiritual realm. Some of the things that I know as demonic and satanic has similar just outward expressions if you just look at it. So Edward said, you can't tell something's God or not just by looking at manifestations. You've got to look past the manifestations and inspect the fruit. It's the fruit that determines whether or not it's God or not. So tonight, in this message, I am going to give you biblical passages for the basis of impartation. And then I'm going to tell you stories. Because even if I can prove to you that this is biblical, there are parts of the church that wear glasses called cessationism that say, yes, it's biblical, but God quit doing it. He quit that when the last apostle died or when the disciples of the last apostle died or when the canon was can or scripture was canonized and it's not been needed anymore. That's just a scaffolding to get the church started. Now it's not needed. So the stories, because if you don't believe God does that anymore and these stories are he's doing it right now, then you've got to say, then that wasn't God. And if it's something that's impossible for a human being to do, then the only option you have left, once you say it's not God, and you know a human can't do that, is you got to do what I call the Beelzebub controversy, which is what the enemy has only used one major argument against the moves of God in the 2,000 years of Christian history. Eddie Hyatt wrote a book called 2,000 Years of Charismatic Christianity. In it, he basically shows there's one big argument that was used against almost every move of God, and it's this. You call the move of God the work of the devil. Pentecostals 
in the early 1900s, it was thought to be demonic. I've stood in one of the greatest churches in England, Westminster Chapel, flagship of evangelicalism, and G uh, Campbell Morgan was the pastor in the early days of Pentecostalism. He said, Pentecostalism is the last vomit of Satan. The founder of the Holiness Church of the Nazarene, which was called and was first founded, the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene, dropped the word Pentecostal from its title because he thought Azusa Street was a terrible and craziness. Most of Protestantism thought the early days of Pentecostalism was it wasn't of God. But the fruit has proven them wrong. And Pentecostals right. Because there's been no move of God that's brought as many people into the kingdom of God as the Pentecostal movement has done. 80% of all Christians south of the equator have a Pentecostal experience. Wherever the church is growing the fastest in the world, it's a Pentecostal expression of experience. So all those great men of God who said it wasn't God are were wrong. History has proved them wrong. Many moves of God that was at the time thought, matter of fact, the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening by history were taught. It was a Great Awakening. But you know what it was called at the time? You see, Jonathan Edwards had his Hank Hanegraaff. Jonathan Edwards had his John MacArthur. And he won the argument through the media. And when fear came upon the people because they were told this wasn't God, one thing that would cause a fire revival to go out is no new wood coming. And once fear causes the people to come, it begins to die out. And the man who accused this of not being a God went ahead and later became the founder of the Unitarian Un or Universalist Church. So what does the scripture say about impartation? You know, I get asked all the time, what does this word mean, impartation? When I went to Brazil, there was no Portuguese word for impartation. In Spanish, it's impartacion. But in Portuguese, now they've, they've created a word, impartacion. But then they didn't even have a word for it. And so every time I'd say impartation, my translator would say transferencia de un son. The transference of the anointing. But even in that translation causes people to have misunderstanding of what I teach and what others teach about impartation. We do not teach that we can give you what we have. We do not teach that we are the ones that's causing any of this to happen. We do not teach that by our laying on of our hands, you're going to get an impartation. I do not believe that. That's not possible. The guy who came to my church that God used in my life, he saw the Spirit of God fall upon me, and he told me to raise my hands. And when I did, the power of God hit me, but he saw the Spirit touching me. He didn't even pray for me. He didn't even lay hands on me. But he saw God do it. What we do believe is this. Biblically speaking, you have the, the pattern and even the language in the Scripture. In the Old Testament, you have people who receive impartations without the laying on of hands and with the laying on of hands. Numbers 11, 17, God spoke to Moses said, Gather the elders together, the tent of meeting, and I'll come down. I'll take of the spirit that's on you, his spirit, and put it on them. It's not Moses didn't do it. All Moses did was gather them together. And God said, You do that, and I'll do the rest. I will come down, and I will take of the spirit. My spirit is on you, Moses. They need that spirit of wisdom to be the judges of this nation. And I'm going to take the spirit on you, and I'm going to put it on them. And when it happened, they all prophesied. As a matter of fact, when people are filled with the Spirit, it involves their tongues. Praise, preaching, boldly, tongues, prophecy, something to deal with speech happens almost every time you see it, if anything is listed. So Moses didn't lay hands on anybody. I want you to know, you're, not, you're up in the balcony. You don't have to come to me or somebody on the team, and I'm going to have the team help me pray for you. We're going to bless what we see God doing. 
But I want you to know God can do it to you without us touching you. Because if you've somehow got your faith, I can be touched if Randy or Marcus or, or, or Pastor Jim or somebody else lays hands on me, then you got your focus in the wrong place. I just want you to know I know who I am and what I am. I'm a vessel of clay. I call myself the donkey that sometimes Jesus rides into a church on. You know the story, the little donkey, he went out and he, he came back because he'd been out on Palm Sunday and then he told the old mule, man, you should have seen it, man. I was, man, there's people taking off their cloaks and putting them in front of me and they were taking palm branches and waving it, and they were just saying Hosanna to me. And the old mule said to the little donkey, he said, were you carrying anybody on you today? He said, yeah, I had this man they called Jesus on. He said, oh, little donkey, they weren't doing that for you. They weren't excited about you. They were excited about the one you were carrying. And I didn't get to do what I'm doing because I volunteered for it. I was drafted. And I had no idea. And, and, and at first when I heard these prophecies about what God was going to do with me, I couldn't believe them. I have a Texan who gave me all these prophecies about one day you're going to lead a great revival. One day you're going to speak to 100,000 people and I didn't even have 100 to speak to. I threw all those prophecies and he even mailed them to me after he called me. I threw them in the waste scan. But 10 years later... When it began to happen in Toronto, I called him and said, do you happen to have any copies of those prophecies that you sent to me? I've, I've lost them. He did. And, and those words I could not believe because there was such a gap between where I was and what God says I was going to do was so far. In my mind, there's no way that could ever be possible. I didn't even get off the phone. This guy's named Richard Holcomb. I'm from... I'm trying to think now the name, Hill Country, what's the name of the town? Huh? Kerrville, Kerrville, Texas. And uh, so I, he's telling me all about this stuff. And I get off the phone and I say to my wife, he's crazy. He's saying I'm going to speak to 100,000 people, going to lead a great revival. I'd like to speak to 100. It's craziness what he's talking about. But God did it. Do not despise a prophecy that's so great over your life that your faith can't lay hold of it. Don't despise it. Just put it on the back burner. Because when God starts to bring it to pass, you remember that word that was given. And then you know, my gosh, God told me this was going to happen. Am I? Oh, see, I, I, I get frustrated with people say, well, I had this word that I'm going to do this and it, it hasn't happened. It's been two weeks. It's not happened. I've had guys in my own church get mad at God because there's a real, really powerful word over their life, a prophecy, and it hadn't happened in a year. And they got angry at God. For me, some of the words over my life were, were 10 years in coming. Some were 14. I got a word I'm believing this because it came from so many people that it's been 25 years and it's not happened yet. But that encourages me because I'm right on Abraham's time right now. <laughs> Can there be abuse? Yes. Can there be false prophecy? Yes. Yes, there can. But there also is the real. So Numbers eleven seventeen, 17, nobody lays hands. Moses lays no hands on any of those elders. But then in Deuteronomy 34, 9, it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, received a spirit of wisdom because, poor K in Portuguese, because Moses laid his hands on him. But it wasn't Moses' anointing. It was God that did it, but he used laying on of hands. All I want to say is, biblically speaking, if I say you cannot receive anything unless somebody who's an apostle lays hands on you. That would be heresy. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. Many times it, it, it was apostles who laid hands. But it's not just apostles. God can use lay people. When it came to a, the impartation and the healing of the greatest person after Jesus Christ in the New Testament, 
Saul, who became Paul, he didn't use any of the apostles to lay hands on him. He used this disciple in Damascus and sent him. And the one, the great apostle Paul, it was not an apostle who laid hands on him and prophesied to him about what he was going to do and healing came to him. It was a lay person. You see, God can use whoever he wants for whatever he wants. So I am not saying this is the domain of apostles. I'm not saying hands have to be laid on because that'd be non-biblical, unbiblical. On the other hand, to say that it's wrong to lay hands on. We shouldn't talk about that. That's not biblical either. Because in the Bible, God is a God of diversity and does it different ways with different people. In my own life, the first time, no hands was laid on me. Second time, hands were laid on me. Third time, when Rodney Howard Brown prayed for me in Tulsa, I fell down. Hands were laid on me. But then I didn't have any electricity. Nothing. No heat. Nothing. I just fell down. I actually thought I'm weak-minded, as power suggested. This isn't God because I had God in my box of vineyard. The vineyard God, he shakes you, rattles you, rocks you, and rolls you, and knocks you down. And that's what I was expecting. And none of that happened. I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, and tremendous peace came on me, and I got healed of my nerves. And I went home, and the next Sunday, next day was Sunday, and I saw more heaven break out in my church than anything I'd ever seen. More powerful than the shaking, more powerful than the heat, more powerful than the electricity. What I'm saying is, I, you can't put your faith in the manifestations. It's in the fruit. And as a result of that, all heaven broke out. Went to back to the regional meeting in the vineyard. All heaven fell down again. That opened it up to go to Toronto, and once again, all heaven fell. And I'll tell you a little bit of the fruit as we go on. Staying with the scriptures, Elijah went up to Eli- Elijah went up to Elisha. He's plowing with his 12 oxen, and Elijah is being obedient to what God said, threw his coat on him. I think that's where Benny Hinn gets his biblical basis for throwing the coat. <laughs> and he turned and walked away and he said, What have I done to you? Because he realized it wasn't him, it was God that had done it. But he had been obedient to the word of the Lord. And he knew Elijah's life was going to be changed. One of the, my friend, who's a Pentecostal, my vice president, classical Pentecostal, he did his doctoral dissertation on the fruit of being baptized in the Spirit. And one of the things was not only seeing more healings, more joy, a, a whole bunch, a whole list, a litany of... But one of the things was... Frequent changes of addresses. Because a lot of them were fired. Or ones who weren't fired, they sent a change in their ministry. They got promoted to bigger and better churches, greater ministry. Laying on of hands is in the Old Testament. And it's in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 19 and Acts chapter 8, 8 is J- Peter and John go down where Philip's preached. They have believed. Uh, they've been baptized. But the Spirit has not come. It's a preposition called upon them. And so Peter and John lays their hands on them. And Simon the sorcerer offers Peter money so that whoever I lay my hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. Because they could see something was, he could see something was happening. I don't know what, but it was visible. You could see it. Acts chapter 19, the apostle Paul has met these disciples. And Luke will use the word disciple. Disciples of John the Baptist as well as disciples of Jesus. And probably they were disciples of John the Baptist. And they weren't even good disciples of that because they haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. Paul instructs them more fully. And then if you believe that Paul was a Baptist... He has to believe they have been, they've been saved before he baptizes them 
or if he's Church of Christ, he baptizes them as their act of confession and surrender. And anyway, the point is they experience baptism, which means they are definitely Christian now, but they're still lacking. And then Paul lays his hands on them. And when he laid his hands on them, they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Yet, in Acts 2, there is no laying on of hands at Pentecost. In Acts 4, 29 through 31, there's no laying on of hands when the Spirit of God fell. In answer to the prayer, God, make us bold. Let us proclaim your word of God with boldness. Reach out your hand with signs and wonders. And when the Spirit of God fell, the very building shook. And they did exactly, they got exactly what they did. And they went out and they proclaimed the word of God as the Spirit enabled them with boldness. But no hands were laid on. In Acts 10, when the Spirit of God fell on Cornelius' household, there's no laying on of hands. And they they spoke in tongues even as the first apostles did, or disciples did on the day of Pentecost. Now, that's really an interesting. He's bringing them a message by which they will be saved. Now, I know A.T. Pearson used the word saved in the sense of being fulfilled in every way. But if he used it in a normal way, Peter is going to bring you a message by which you will be, future sense, saved. And when he's talking about, he's sharing the gospel. It's really interesting what, what he's talking about when the Spirit fell. Now, that messes me up until I went to Russia. And I met the wife of the leading apostle of one of the greatest charismatic networks in Russia. And she was a Jew. An atheistic Jew. Her dad was a professor in science. And she got curious, and she wanted to go out, and this is when the church was illegal, and they, she went out into the forest in the winter time to check out, wanted to meet some Christians, because she had no idea what they would be like. And as she walks up to them, they're worshiping, and as they're worshiping, they were Pentecostals, and as they were worshiping, they were singing in tongues and praying in tongues. And she went up to one of the women, knowing nothing about God at all, and she pecked her on the shoulder, and she said, what is this you're doing? And she said, this is called tongues. And she said, I want it because it's making me feel good. (laughs) And this woman, now even the Baptists are strict in Russia. And the Pentecostals can be even stricter. And she said, I'm sorry, but you're not good enough. (laughs) Well, that's not the issue. Because she was, she didn't know Jesus. Didn't know Jesus. Here's one one. My point in this is that Jesus... And his father are bigger than Pentecostal doctrine, Presbyterian doctrine, Catholic doctrine, Baptist doctrine. There's a lot more diversity in the New Testament than what we realize. And I had no place to put this because she said, I turned around and took about three steps and power God hit me. And I started speaking in tongues instantly. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The order salute us there, the order of salvation. That's out of order. You're supposed to get saved before you get baptized in the Spirit. You can't speak in tongues. You haven't even repented yet. You don't even know the gospel yet. And God said, hey, bam, I got you, and I'll fill you in later. And I thought, now that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Have you ever heard that God, the Bible says that God will sometimes confirm things to you by two witnesses? Now, that's the first time in all of my life I ever heard of such a thing as that. The next day, I'm in Ukraine. And I'm going to this Pentecostal church, the biggest church in the city. And this guy tells me his story. And his story was this. He had never been to church. He'd never heard the gospel. He got curious. There's some Christians meeting in an open meeting in the street. And he wants to go check it out. Just out of curiosity. He walked into their midst, and they're worshiping, and they're singing in tongues. And he said, I'm just standing there watching. I've never been to a Christian meeting before in my life. And then suddenly, bam, he's speaking in tongues. They think he's an implant from the KGB because they don't know him. And they take him to the leader, and the leader says, how long have you been doing this? And he said, five minutes. (laughs) When did you give your life to Jesus? What does that mean? When did you believe the gospel? What's the gospel? When did you repent? What is that? The Pentecostal leader had the wisdom to know that God in his sovereignty had chosen this man. And he realized that the order of salutus is out of order, but God is God and do it any way he wants. And God is 
God has called this man, anointed this man, filled him with the Holy Spirit when he hasn't even heard the gospel yet. So I said, I, I shared the gospel with him. And, I, and he told me, he said, those Pentecostals, they got a big list of sin. He said, here's the list of sin. He went through them all. I hadn't done a lot of them, but I confessed them all anyway because he told me to. I confessed everything he said, and I confessed them all. And then he says, now, do you know what this means? And I accepted Jesus. And he said, now, do you know what this means? He says, no. <laughs> He said, you need to be honest with you. Everything seemed kind of like bad news. All this stuff, bad stuff, and hadn't done a lot of it. He said, what this means is that the God that created everything there is in the universe, a God big enough to do that, has just come to live inside of you. And he said, oh, now that was good news. And I went home, I gathered my family, and I gathered all my neighbors, and I, I said, hey, Watch this. Oh, Kalara Mara Sunday. Kirulia Bala. Korara Bala Mara Sandakva. Kurila Mara Mara Sunday. And he said, You know what that means? It means the God that made the universe is living inside of me, and He's forgiven me of all my sin, and He wants to be inside of you. And I led all of my family, I led all of my neighbors to the Lord. My theology had no place for that, <laughs> but my heart leapt with the joy of a God big enough to do that. <laughs> Maybe that's some of what Cornelius might have experienced, except Cornelius was at least hearing the gospel. So there's diversity in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through 2, it's the only place in the Bible that gives the six elementary teachings or foundational teachings of Christianity. Now, I went through four years of college, majored in mind, took all my electives, religious studies, three more years... To Master of Divinity, so I got seven years of theological training and never heard one teaching in all those years and in all those classes because I went to a Baptist school <laughs> about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not one teaching about laying on of hands. In those six foundational teachings, they are really simple. It's the Alpha Course of the first century is one, repentance from acts that lead to death. Two, faith in God. Isn't that simple? Isn't that foundational? Three, the doctrine of baptisms. Plural, not singular. Water baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Evangelicals love to quote so much. For by one spirit, we've all been baptized into one body. We're the Jew or Greek bond or free. And we've all been given to the spirit to drink. That's conversion. Being baptized into Christ is the work of the Spirit putting us into Jesus. Amen. So the person being worked on is us. The agent is the Holy Spirit putting us into Jesus. The early church taught once you've been baptized and come into Christ and you've been regenerated, you have now been fitted to lift up your holy hands and ask your Father to give you the gifts of the Holy Spirit and to fill you and baptize you with the Holy Spirit, which was subsequent. In the earliest theology of the church, you come into the water, and you're baptized in the name of the Father. The Son is a triple immersion in the Holy Spirit. Now that you're in Christ, baptized, then they pray a prayer for deliverance. Not before you get in, but after you're baptized. And then they lay hands on you and anoint you with oil and pray that you would be filled and sealed and anointed with the gift of the Spirit and His gifts. This is the early teaching of the church that was rediscovered in the 20th century by Pentecostalism within Protestantism. It's biblical. It's historical. It's so baptisms, water baptism, baptism into Christ. But then Jesus is called the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And, and he is the one, having come into Christ, that now he, not the Holy Spirit putting you in Jesus, but now the, Jesus overwhelms you with the Holy Spirit. So there's multiple baptisms. But the next one, number four, is the laying on of hands. So what's laying on hands for? To bless people. They asked Jesus to lay his hands on the children. 
Bless the children. You shall lay your hands on the sick, and they shall recover. It's part of the teaching of the laying on of hands. Laying on of hands was also for impartation of gifts and sometimes being filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean it has to happen to receive. I received the gift of tongues when I was 19 years old by myself, praying by myself. In the, I was assistant pastor of the Baptist church, and I kept it a secret so I wouldn't be fired for years. I told my friends, led many of them into the baptism. But I had never had an experience like I did at 32 and 39 where I felt like, officially at 39, I thought I was going to die. There's more. If you think you have all there is, you'll not be hungry or thirsty for more. If you think you have all that there is and there's nothing else to have, then you're going to be frustratedly content or happily content. One of the two depends. Number five was the resurrection of the dead, and number six was eternal judgment. Number four, laying on of hands. Number three, doctrine of baptisms. That's what I'm talking about tonight. Foundational stuff in the Bible. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, I wanted to come to you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. It still happens today. In 1 Timothy 4, 14, do not neglect the gift of God that is within you through a prophetic word when the body of elders laid their hands on you. called a presbytery, the body of elders, when the presbytery laid their hands on you. 2 Timothy 1, 6, fan in the flame the gift of God that's within you through the laying on of my hands. So there's the biblical basis. What I'm talk See, if you don't believe what I'm talking about is biblical, you're going to be leery. You're not going to be totally open. I'm trying to remove confusion about something that is biblical. Now, I want to share some stories of what happens to some people. And because I'm in a Pentecostal church, I'm going to use several Pentecostal illustrations. Because to be honest with you, sometimes the Pentecostal church is one of the hardest churches I've been in for this to happen. Because there's a tendency sometimes to say, been there, done that. I've already spoken in tongues. I've, I've had my carpet time back in, you know, 1906 or 1930 or 1947 or 48 or 1960s in the charismatic movement or 1970s in the Jesus movement or the 19 mid-90s in Pensacola or Toronto. Or been there, done that, got the T-shirt, had the rug time. But there's more. This whole thing about one baptism, many fillings, is really not the biblical language. Because in the book of Acts, they don't even use the word baptize so much. They use the word filling. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. They filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. They filled with the Holy Spirit. Pro proclaimed the word of God. With boldness. They filled with the Holy Spirit. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I got, I'm an Assembly of God church on the south side of the city. And I'm, I'm, I've got about 30 uh, leaders, pastors, <clears throat> and missionaries there. And they asked me to pray for them. So I'm going down, and I don't get a prophecy for anybody. I don't say anything except Phil. I'm following Rodney. Phil, Phil, Phil. I asked Rodney once if he ever found Phil. But anyway, Phil, <laughs> Phil, Phil, Phil. And I don't say anything, just Phil, Phil. And they all fell down. I could not have told you by manifestations if one of those got more than another because they all look basically the same. There wasn't like one, because one of the things you're going to hear me say, I will talk about some manifestations. But I want you to know, just because somebody doesn't manifest doesn't mean they didn't get a powerful anointing. There were no powerful manifestations on any of those 30 uh, Assembly God leaders. But one of them, I went back to that city, to the north side, this south side, two months later. The people came to me and said, have you heard what happened to one of those guys you prayed for last time you were here? I said, no, I haven't heard a thing. He said, yeah, he was a missionary, a Pentecostal Assembly God missionary to Honduras. 
Now, he had been there for 30 years. He's assembly of God. He already spoke in tongues. He had a theology that did not change. He needed to change nothing in his theology. Some of us had to change a lot of theology to make room for experience. He didn't. He'd already had an experience. But that day, in two months after that day, that man saw more healings in two months than he had seen the preceding 30 years. Something happened. There was more. You say, well, he's already baptized. I'm not re disputing he's already baptized in the Spirit. I'm saying he got baptized again. And if you don't like that sin, then he got a refill. It's amazing. Sometimes the <clears throat> octane level may be more powerful on the refill than the first fill. <laughs> Was in his case. Heidi Baker, you know about Heidi Baker. She was born again on a reservation, I think in Mississippi, an Indian reservation. And either that night or the next Sunday night after being born again, she gets filled with the Holy Spirit, speaks in tongues, taken into a vision, and hears the voice of God and tells her the three continents she's going to spend her life in. I think that's a pretty big experience. I think she's baptized in the Spirit. She became a wonderful missionary. But when she came to Toronto, she's burned out. When she came and her husband, whose, whose grandfather is one of the first Pentecostal missionaries in China, whose father was Assembly God missionary, full-time missionary, he's the grandson, he's Pentecostal, she's Pentecostal, but they're both burned out. He's depressed, she's discouraged. And on her way to Toronto, she says, God, I am so exhausted. If you don't touch me, I don't know how I can go on. She came, as I was preaching, she came to the front. I saw her. I didn't know I prophesied. I thought I was just praying. I said, Heidi, God wants to know, do you want the nation of Mozambique? She says, yes. I heard myself say, God is going to give you the nation of Mozambique. You'll see the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the dead be raised. Power of God instantly hits her, and she's sweating profusely. She said, I felt like I stuck into an oven. I just began to sweat, and I'm shaking, and the power is rolling through me wave after wave, and she's having one of those finny experiences, you know. And she told me later, she, it was just amazing, and it lasted seven days and seven nights. I had to be carried out and carried back in, and I don't have time to go into all the details of what happened. But what did happen is the fruit, not the manifestation, but the fruit in the next 18 months, nothing. I oh, got you on that one. You weren't <laughs> thinking that, were you? Most of that, most people don't know that part of the story. What happened? The government came and confiscated their buildings, took them away. A church in New York that loved them as missionaries did not like Toronto and said, you quit talking about Toronto or that million dollars that the church and the pastor promised them, you're not going to get it. And she wouldn't back away. Lost a million dollars. Lost a million dollars. Lost all their buildings. Her husband gets cerebral malaria. Her daughter gets malaria three times. She gets hit with MS. And they're told if she goes back to Mozambique, she'll die. And she said to the doctor, I will not die. I have a prophecy. God is going to give me the nation of Mozambique. The blind are going to see. The deaf are going to hear. The lame are going to walk. And the dead are going to be raised. And what happened in the first 18 months? She prayed for every blind person she met and not one of them saw. She prayed for all the deaf people she met, not one of them heard. She prayed for all the cripples she met. Nobody walked. Everything's going the opposite. And I'm glad nobody told that testimony, me praying for her during those 18 months or nobody would have ever wanted me to pray for them again. <laughs> and I asked her one time, Heidi, let me ask you a question. If I had given you exactly the same words but they hadn't been backed up by the power of God that caused you to have all those manifestations. Could you have sustained your faith that it was really God if it had been my words without heaven's power backing it up? And she said, no, I know I couldn't have. But I could not doubt. Even though everything's going the wrong way and going the opposite way, I couldn't doubt it was God because of his power. 
And that's what gave her the strength to sustain her faith, no matter what the devil threw against her. I have a friend who's a professor at seminary, and he's Assemblies of God. And he's my favorite professor, John Ruthven. And he said, in the Bible, the way faith is, that faith comes from hearing God. Faith comes from the revelation of God. Faith comes from the rhema words. And faith is not only hearing, but it's obeying what you hear. And faith, New Testament speaking, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, when you're trying to follow God, you will be, there will be opposition, there will be backlash, there will be a battle. But faith is not only hearing and obeying, but faith is also persevering. And this is what I believe. Sometimes the call of God on you is going to be so challenging and so costly that you're going to have to have something so real that you know the devil cannot shake you in your faith. And God often gives some of the greatest experiences to the greatest challenges that you're going to have. There's a guy named Hinaldo. He's Foursquare, Pentecostal, in Brazil, Sao Paulo. He came to one of our meetings in the United States, in the Voice of the Apostles. And every, every speaker he had lay hands on him. He spent most of his four days in front of the platform laying on the floor. Hinaldo's father was the, over the state of Sao Paulo. Hinaldo himself was over the youth movement in 12,000 Foursquare churches. Hinaldo had a church of several thousand. Hinaldo spoke in tongues already. He had already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But when he went home, in the next year, he had over 200 deaf ears open. Revival broke out in his church. Revival began to break out in the denomination. He was touched. He was hungry. He wanted more. But it's not just preachers. One four square woman pastor, pastora, came to me in Fortaleza. I prayed for her. A year later, she came back and she said, I got your anointing. I said, Tell me about it. She says, I prayed for 200 deaf ears that have opened in one year. I said, You didn't get my anointing. I've prayed for three in my lifetime at that time. She got more. I went to a church, a charismatic church called Videra in Goiânia, Brazil. The pastor said, see that woman over there? We call her Hoochie. That's Ruth in Portuguese because I'm Hanji. R's have an H sound and first of a word. So I'm Hanji Clarky because you can't end something in a vowel, consonant. He said, we call her Hoochie. We call her the little Hanji Clarky. I said, why? Because I'd been there like six years earlier or four years, something like that, and prayed till like three in the morning. 6,000 people were in the meeting. I started to preach at 11 o'clock at night. The sermon's going to be an hour with translation, two hours. And I said, if you can't wait till 1 o'clock in the morning, go home. We're going to sing a song and go home. Three half of the people left. I was so happy. <laughs> 1 o'clock in the morning, we start praying, and we prayed till 3. One of those that was received prayer. And the pastor made sure that I prayed for all 200 of his pastors twice. And he said, you see that woman over there? We call her that hoochie, the little handy clarky. I said, why? Because she got more than anybody else in this church. More people gets healed when she prays than anybody. More people falls down when she prays for them than anybody. More people are overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit when she prays than anybody. This was a cell-based church, and she's not even a cell group leader. God chose to give the strongest anointing to one of the least with no responsibility or authority to prove his grace, to let us know it's all about God. It's all about God. I can't give you anything. The team that's going to help me, we can't give you anything. God can give you everything. Now, here's the way it works. I got, I got a warning for you. Nobody is safe in this room. <clears throat> That's a warning. It's also an encouragement. 
Because one of the biggest things that keeps some people from receiving is they're so convinced that they're not good enough. They're so convinced that they got to be just so much better than they are. Normally, the norm is this. God rewards in public for what's been going on in private. The norm is this. Those that's been fasting and praying, crying out for more, are usually the ones that he comes upon and touches. But he also has his exceptions. In my Baptist church, I was the only one in 84 fasting and praying, asking God to come. Nobody else was. Nobody else even knew what to expect. And when the Spirit fell on the first service, I'm watching people can't get out of the room before they get knocked to the floor and get drunk in the Spirit and shaking and sweating. And, and I'm sitting there and said, God, this is not right. None of those people even want this. I do. You're not touching me. What's wrong with me? See, what is wrong with me is where we go and instantly. Second service, same thing happened. I'm sitting there feeling nothing and I see people in my church getting touched. What's wrong with me? It wasn't an issue of what's wrong with me. It was an issue of God's timing. And I don't want you to think these things happen all the time. I've had three of these experiences in 48 years of being a ministry and 50 years of being a Christian. They're precious. Next to marriage, birth of children, nothing, nothing, nada comes even close to being as precious as those visitations when God himself came and touched and changed my life. We need to honor. We need to cherish. We need not to be afraid. We need to be open. Because the night that I was touched, the preacher from the vineyard named Blaine Cook, he said this, and I've given this invitation Myself, every time I've taught on this since 1984, this is what he said. I do not want you to come to the front just because you want to. Because a lot of you are going to want to. What I want you to do is to wait on God. And if you begin to cry, it's a sense of his love. I want you to come to the front. If you begin to feel that you're getting hot, a supernatural heat, I want you to come to the front. If you begin to feel the glory come upon you where it feels like I'm so heavy, I can't even hardly lift an arm. I can't lift. It's hard to move. There's this weight, uh, weightiness on me. I want you to come to the front. If you begin to feel the tingling or electricity in your body or on your head, I want you to come to the front. He said, I, I want you to wait, and we're going to honor God, and let's start with who he starts with. And when you see what he does to them, it's going to increase your faith for what he can do to you. And in that meeting that night was a civil engineer in my church who was against the meeting, who thought I was running the Baptist church by having a healing meeting in the Baptist church. He got there late, missed the whole sermon because he's a civil engineer, been in a municipality meeting, standing back, hand up against the wall. And when he heard that, all those things, that if, 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 this, this, this come forward, he said, that's a bunch of bull. Would you say he was not likely to get touched? He said, that is a bunch of bull. And as soon as he said bull, he thought his hand had gone to sleep, leaning up against the wall. He starts trying to wake it up, and then the other one starts getting filled with electricity. And then they start hurting so much that literally no exaggeration. He's coming down the middle aisle of the Baptist church, and this is the worst Christian in my church. He had been on my board for tw uh, seven years. And he was saved the night before when this guy called Robert Morris had come to my little Baptist church. And Robert Morris had preached, and he said, came up to me that day before this happened that night, and he said, I've been your convert for seven years. And I realized last night I wasn't even saved, even though I was on your board, which showed how much discernment I had. <laughs> but last night I gave my life to Jesus, but he's still against this meeting. He's one of the worst, truly was one of the worst Christians in my church. Full of pride. <laughs> he 
He starts coming down the aisle. <laughs> literally, literally, I mean, I can't make my hands go as fast as his. They were, and he's been over in the glory. He's sweating in the heat, and he's crying. But it's just not tears. He's boohooing, and he is the proudest man in the church. He's, God has broke him. He's coming down the aisle. Everything he mocked, God's doing to him, and he's crying like this. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, help me, Randy. Help me, Randy. Help me, Randy. And I said, John, what's wrong? He said, I can't stop crying and I've got my contact in and I've cried so hard. My, this is the day of hard contacts. My left eye, it's killing me and I can't get my contact out with my hands doing this. Help me. <laughs> and I said, John, that could be a word of knowledge because we've just been talking about words of knowledge the session before. He said, you and those words of knowledge, I don't even believe in them. <laughs> right then, a 14-year-old girl whose dad is one of my leaders who will not come to the meeting, who's boycotting the meeting because he said, you can't teach people how to heal. I said, do you ever go to evangelism class? Yeah. Baptists are good at evangelism. I said, I didn't think we could save anybody either. Only God can save. But he still didn't get it and he wouldn't come. He's mad. He's against the meeting. But God in his grace, it's his daughter. And she knocks on John's shoulder. And John turns around and she said, that's me. I just came from the optometrist. They just told me my eye is so crossed, I've got to have it fixed by surgery. And John stopped shaking. And this man who just mocked all this stuff, it only took 60 seconds in the anointing to transform him into a man who some 35 years later is still on fire for God. Even though he's still a civil engineer, he's still casting out demons and healing the sick everywhere he goes. And John said, I command that eye to be straight. Open your eyes. Still crazy. He did it five times, and it was straight. And then the next night, that woman, girl, 14, Tammy, she came up to John and I and a couple of women, deacon's wife, and she said, I need to be healed. I said, you just got healed last night. I have spinal bifida. I have to wear a diaper. I don't have any control of my bladder. I was born a hydrocephalic. I've had shunts put in. I have terrible seizures. I'm on all kinds of medication. And it wasn't anybody from the visiting church. It's just us, much like last night. It wasn't anybody coming from the outside. But it was you guys. Because he wanted you to realize how he wants to use you. That your faith would be in him, not somebody else that comes to visit. And he used it for good. Enemy will not mess us up as much on travel in the future because he knows what's liable to happen. <laughs> so we prayed and on the way home, Tammy said to her mother, as they're walking home, Mommy, do I have to wear a diaper tonight? And her mother, as an act of faith, said, no, you don't. Tammy Ferguson never had to wear another diaper for the rest of her life. Never had to have another shunt put in. The fluid started going down her spine. Never had to take another, uh, have another visit to the neurologist. She had several neurologists because all those seizures stopped. Now listen, but this got me in trouble. Because some of the religious people in my church who didn't like the Holy Spirit came to me and said, we don't believe this is God. And I said, why? They said, because of who he touched. He didn't touch the chairman of the deacon board, who was a very good man, holy man. He didn't touch my best friend who wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit and wanted to speak in tongues. He did not get touched then. And we prayed for him three times a week till October, and that was March, before God sovereignly then fell on him and gave him everything he wanted. Two of the best men in my church did not get touched, and John was one of the worst. And Barbara, oh, Barbara was backslidden. She hadn't been to church in months and didn't even know why she came that night. And God came on her, and she came to the front, and she's shaking, and Blaine prayed this famous prayer that later we prayed in Toronto a lot. More, Lord. And bam, down Barbara went. 
And three hours later, somebody else had to drive her home because she's still so drunk she can't drive in the Holy Spirit. And her husband, who had been really bad PTSD from Vietnam, hadn't been in church since. The next day, God will save him because of what he's working in his wife. We don't believe this is God. Why? Because of who he's touching. And who he didn't touch in that service. And they said, why would he do that? And I said, you know, this is my first experience. I don't know anything about this. I'm just getting started. I said, I don't know, but I'll go ask him. I'm almost done. We're getting ready to have the invitation. I'll go ask him. So I went and I said, Lord, you got me in trouble. <laughs> they should know I can't do this. They should know I can't cause this type of disruption and all that you're doing. But they don't believe it's you, God, because they think you... You, you, you miss some people you should have touched, and you touch some people you should have skipped. Why? And it was as clear as day. I didn't have to pray 40 hours. I didn't have to pray 40 days or fast 40 days. It just instantly the message and answer came. He said, what's the word for gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? I said, it's charismata, from which we get the word charismatic. He said, what's the root of that word? I said, it's charis. He said, what's that word mean? I said, Lord, it means grace. He said, that's your answer. But the next thing was so clear. You know, God didn't speak to me in King James English, and he's got a sense of humor. He said, I've been around a long time. <laughs> I thought that was humorous. And I know you people, and I know what you human beings are like. And I know that if I only touch those who deserve it, if I only touch your best, and I don't touch people that everybody knows they don't deserve it. You would turn, you human beings would turn my charismata, my grace gifts into works of mata. And because you think you've earned them, and rather than receiving by grace, you wouldn't be nearly as grateful. That's why I do that, Randy. So everybody will know it's by grace. Everybody receives on the basis of grace that means nobody's safe <laughs> just very quickly I want to add one more story about a woman in, Swiss, in Denmark in Copenhagen she's introverted she came forward God touched her she has more people get healed percentage wise than Oral Roberts did Jack Cole, Amy Silk McPherson. Because one of the books I read talked about all those very famous healing events and their healing lines had about 15% get healed. It came through the line. This woman has 42% of the people she's prayed for on the streets. She keeps a notebook, puts her name when she prayed and follows up. She has 42, and in, in, in a few years she had 1,800 people healed on the streets or 42% of the people she was praying for. Nobody knows her name. I don't even know her last name. All I know is she's called Karen. Heaven knows her name. Hell knows her name. Yeah. It's honored in heaven and feared in hell. And it started when this Christian in Copenhagen, in a meeting just like this, God chose to give her a great anointing for healing. What has happened? Well, just through Leif Hetland, Heidi Baker, Henry Madava, each one of those who received an impartation in one of our meetings, each one of their, those persons, their ministries led one million people to Jesus. One million each, three million people. Scores of thousands of churches have been started. I know of at least 40,000 churches that have been started through people who were touched as a result of impartation meetings that we have been in. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in Brazil on top of that. I do not believe this is the work of the devil to lead millions of people to Jesus. I don't believe it's the work of the devil to start 40-some thousand years. And that's just in Toronto. That doesn't include Pensacola. 
and all the people. And I haven't lately been meeting these young guys in their 30s, getting close to 40. They were touched in Pensacola, and they're leading powerful moves of God. And see, I don't believe that Pensacola was one thing, and Toronto was one thing, and Smithton was one thing, and Howard Brown was another thing. I believe that's one great big move of God. And the good news is God hasn't quit, and He's still doing it. Would you stand? Would the ministry team please come forward and put your heels up against the platform and face the crowd? I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to pray. I'm going to ask you to take 20, 30 seconds max, and I'm going to tell you right before I went to see Rodney Howard Brown in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when I was touched this last time, I prayed two prayers that night after I had been told about what God was doing through Rodney and healing that was happening. And here was my prayers. Lord, if you'll touch me one more time, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything you say if you'll just touch me. Now, I hadn't had one invitation to go anywhere. So when I said I'll go anywhere, I'm thinking maybe an hour away. Seriously. <laughs> he did exceedingly abundantly above all I asked or thought. But my second prayer was this. I learned it from John Wimber, and it became my prayer. I meant it with all my heart. It was this. God, make me a coin in your pocket and spend me any way you want. Tomorrow, or what is today? Today the 20th? Yeah. Today is the 25th anniversary of when the Spirit fell when I went to Toronto. It's ha it was January the 20th, 1994. I'm still being spent. I thank God for another generation of people that's being touched. Hold your hands out like this. Don't bow your heads, but do close your eyes. I'm going to give you 20 seconds to tell God what you want Him to do to you. And then I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to wait as the Spirit sovereignly begins to fall. And any of those signs ha begins to happen to you, then we're going to ask you to come forward, come really close to the team. The floor will fill up and we'll run out of room, but the team will just walk past those that's lying on the floor and begin going into the aisles and up into the balconies and wherever they see someone being touched of God to come in agreement and bless what they see. There's something powerful when we bless what God is doing rather than trying to ask God to bless what we're doing. Now I'm going to pray for you. Father, I, I bless the name of Jesus. And I thank you, God, for what you're about to do. I thank you, Lord, for the history of what you've been doing. I thank you, Lord, for a future, what you're going to continue to do. I ask God that you would come and fill afresh and fill again. Lord, that you'd touch those like in Acts 4. They'd been at Pentecost in Acts 2, but you touched them again. You filled them again. Come and fill us. I pray, God, for there to be a release of revelatory gifts in this church. As there was in my Baptist church when nobody moved in any of the revelatory gifts, and after that night, all of a sudden, uh, oh, there's a large percentage of my people who are getting words of knowledge and prophecy and having dreams and visions and discerning of spirits and gifts of healing. God, like when we went to the, the Assembly of God Church at Reading where Bill's at, God, that you took them to a new level and they never went down again. It's like 25% instant increase, God. So I pray that what you did in Tom Jones's Pentecostal Church in Inglewood, Florida, God, you radically transformed it. God, I pray in Jesus' name for a release of the gifts of revelation to cause there to be a release of the gift of faith and a responding correlation of the gifts of power, healing, and working of miracles to take place. Come, Holy Spirit, 
Come, Holy Spirit. Send your angels into this place, our fellow workers, in the name of Jesus. Release your fire and your power. Touch them with such power they never can doubt that you did something special to them tonight. More, Lord. More, Lord. Now, I already see. Thank you, Jesus, what is about to happen. I already see some of you, what I said, he's already doing to you. Some of you, I, I can hear the emotion in your wail, hear the emotion in the, in the, in the scream. Uh, some of you, I actually see him touching you. Touch, I see the glory on you. I see his power in your hands. If, you're, he, if there, there's a supernatural heat, you know, recently we had the pastor of the largest Baptist church in Brisbane when he was touched in his church, God knocked him down right in front of his whole church. And for five hours, he sweats through all of his clothes, no dry clothes, a sweat from a supernatural heat. And this last year, five years later, he had 90, 920 new conversions in his church. God transformed that church, grew it from a thousand to multiple thousands. Father, in the name of Jesus, do it again. Touch the people. Touch the people. Touch them, God, in the name of Jesus. If you are being touched by His Spirit, come to the front. Come now. Come now. Come to the front. Come while He's touching you. My Lutheran friend, I see the power of God in your hands. Get up here. More God. More Lord. More, Lord. Now, in about at around nine o'clock, maybe earlier, but at least by nine o'clock, we're going to switch and start praying for the sick. But right now, all we're praying for is people to be filled and the activation of gifts for you to be baptized in the Spirit afresh and for you to receive gifts of the Holy Spirit. Team, when you have prayed, and there's nobody that can get to you, then you begin to work your way through the crowd. More God, more Lord, more Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, more God, more Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Touch him, God. Touch him, Lord. In Jesus' name, my blessing. In Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. More, God. More, Lord. Touch him, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. More, Lord. We bless the catcher. In the name of Jesus. More, God. More, God. More, Lord. More, God. More God. Breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. My, the Muslim world. In the name of Jesus, more God. More Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More God. We bless them. In the name of Jesus. More fire, fire, fire. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More God. More Lord. More God. Bless them, God. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Touch the Father. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Bless you, God. Bless them, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, God, we bless them. We bless them, Lord. Bless them, God. In Jesus' name, more, God. More, Lord. More, Lord. In the name of Jesus. More, God. More, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Come, Holy Spirit. Give her a baptism of love. In the name of Jesus. A baptism of love. In Jesus' name, more, God. We bless her, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, more bless every tear. Fill her, God. In Jesus' name, anointing God. In the name of Jesus, more, more, Lord. 
in the name of Jesus. Fill him, God. Fill him, Lord. Bless her, God, in Jesus' name. Bless the Lord, in Jesus' name. I feel like I'm to pray for this guy right here. Thank you, God. Come, Holy Spirit. Anoint this man. Anoint him. Anoint him. In the name of Jesus. In the name of more power go through her body. Touch him, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. More God. More Lord. More God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, God. We bless him. In Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Touch him, God. God, I bless this man. Fill him. Give him a baptism of love. And let your power flow through him. In the name of Jesus, God. Fill him, Lord. In Jesus' name.